Welcome to Books of Our Time. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and is shown nationwide. The book we'll be discussing today is Right from Wrong, Instilling a Sense of Integrity in Your Child. As the authors write, integrity is not simply something that happens as a result of unconditional love, healthy genes, or good luck. It emerges, if it does, because as a parent, you make it important and you choose to exercise influence in this arena. Combining stories of children in their natural settings with compassionate, in-depth analysis and pragmatic counsel, right from wrong makes the promotion of integrity possible, feasible, indispensable, with valuable lessons on using praise, honesty, questioning, listening, and discipline in a constructive way. You will learn how to foster integrity in your children, making them people whom we admire, as well as people who are proud of themselves. Joining me for this discussion are the authors, Michael Riera and Joe DePrisco. Michael Riera, PhD, has worked in education since 1980. He is the parenting contributor for CBS's The Early Show Saturday, a national speaker on issues pertaining to adolescents and children, and has appeared on many national television shows, including The Oprah Winfrey Show and The Today Show. He is the author or co-author of three books about teenagers, including Field Guide to the American Teenager. Joe DePrisco, PhD, an author and educator. He has published two books about parenting with Mike Riera, two novels, two books of poems, as well as numerous essays and book reviews. He received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and taught for 20 years middle school, high school, and college. Thanks for being with us. Great to be here. Thanks for having us, Kurt. No problem. Um, as I told you uh, before, um, one of the things, one of the reasons why I got interested in your book is because I recently got married three years ago now, and my wife from that previous marriage had three children, and uh, also uh, recently I have a, a baby of my own who's about 22 months old. So I'm interested in books about this kind of thing. I was wondering if you can explain a little bit about, you say that, that teaching integrity is, is one of the most important values that we can instill in our children, and why is that so important? and what do you mean by it? Please. <laughs> well, I, I think it's important because in many <coughs> ways it's the moral compass. It's what you leave kids with. It's, we can't be around our kids all the time. You know, at 22 months, you know, you're around him a lot. But as he gets older, you know, you have older kids too, the 19-year-old, the 20-year-old, you're not around as much. So our job when they're younger is to instill the sense of integrity so that when we're not around, they can make the best decisions for themselves. And that's really what it comes down to. I mean, integrity, refers to that internal sense of wholeness. It's the compass within. And what turned out was when we were on our book tour, actually, for the first book, uh, Field Guide to the American Teenager, we realized that from all the questions we were getting from the audiences, it was that they kept asking about integrity. So, and we realized that we had actually written about it a lot in Field Guide to the American Teenager. And, and, and we began to understand intuitively why this happened. Because integrity is so important, and parenting teenagers is so important, and it's the one, it's the time in a, in a child's life that, that makes parents feel a little bit crazy. Uh, I got a teenager, and so the moral of what we came to the conclusion was that in order to parent a teenager successfully, you can't wait until they're a teenager. You begin well before that. You begin when they're children. You lay the groundwork for, for them uh, being at peace with themselves, being whole with themselves. I see. Does Failing to lay that groundwork, does that lead to problems in the future? Because another thing that I, we also talked about was how I teach legal ethics. And mm -hmm. in, in a particular class, we were talking about the situation where the attorney-client privilege is supposed to be sacrosanct among mm -hmm. lawyers. And yet the point comes up at, at certain times. It's, OK, does the attorney-client privilege always take precedence? Or will there be times when morality may be taught to enter into the, to the equation? And I had one student say, basically, no, it's about the law. It's not about morality. Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing makes me really nervous to hear, I, I have to say. Right. But, but as children, this is when we have the most influence. This is when we have the most say with our kids. And I, and I want to be clear, it's many people confuse, I think, integrity with morals, values, principles, right. which are really important, but they're not the same thing that Joe and I wrote about. The integrity is really this deep sense of what's right and wrong. And, and the hard part for parents to get is the only way you learn to value integrity is by being out of it. So it doesn't mean we have to have perfect kids or be perfect parents. In fact, our kids need to have the experience. So if Joe's my dad, of I tell him a fib, and I get, and he can do something to help me experience the discomfort that I'm having because I'm lying to my dad, because I'm out of my own integrity. Because what we're trying to help kids 
and develop a shorthand language to integrity so that when they're 15, when they're 16, when they're 17 out on a night Friday night with some friends mm -hmm. and someone says, let's do this, they've got that quick response that says, nope, that, that's not, that'll be out of integrity. I don't want to feel that discomfort, so they choose something else to do. Yeah, it's easy to, I think, confuse in, in the public discussion uh, character-based education with what we're talking about. And, and that's the stuff that makes me kind of nervous when, when you get a script, you know, mm -hmm. this is the way you react. Okay, so, you know, here's the beer in the back of the car. Where's the script? Well, you know, it doesn't work that way. Kids don't work that way. We don't work that way. It's way more, more complicated than that, way more interesting than that. And, and so we've tried to situate the issue of integrity in, in, in several contexts. One is, of course, we, you know, there's this national context of this debate. Um, Enron, the, tr the priest scandal, whatever. I mean, and, and, and we need, excuse the term, greater transparency in our systems. There's no question about it. We also want to talk about integrity as a personal kind of crisis. If, if integrity isn't a crisis for you and for you, and if it isn't a problem, then you have nothing to say on the subject. If it's never been, if it's always been easy to have integrity, you have nothing to learn. In fact, I don't know what you've learned in life. Mm -hmm. Then on another level, we're talking about integrity as a parenting issue. That is, what does it mean to be a parent in integrity, to, to deal with the conflict that comes about as a, as a result of daily life with your children? And it's not, it, it, and it's not very easy to understand at first, at first blink. Uh, and then the, third, the fourth level would be integrity as an issue in our institutions like schools. And the common denominator here is for us, if, you, if integrity is important, it needs to be articulated as important. If, if it's not important to me as a parent, it's not important to me as a citizen, if it's not important to me as a, as a, a member of a school community, then it's not going to be important to our kids. Mm -hmm. Should it be important? I don't think there's anything more important. Mm -hmm. You can take anything away from me except my integrity. We also talked earlier, though, uh, Joe, it's interesting you bring that up because there's this sense that morality can sometimes be divorced from integrity. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mean, if, if integrity is defined then as a, as a wholeness, then somebody who has the values of, I think we talked about, a skinhead mm -hmm. can be one of the most, uh, you know, persons with the greatest integrity. How, how do you, uh, you know, square that with what you're saying? You know, I guess I, 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 I take issue with that because mm -hmm. really I think Anyone, I mean, I think there are certain intrinsic values we talked about at lunch that people have, and that mm. um, regardless of morality, that they're deeper, and that we know that harming another person is just wrong. Mm. And, and I really think a lot of times, you know, Joe talked about articulating what integrity is to kids. A lot of times this is through the right. questions we ask right. them. It's not lectures we give them, but, you know, let's say you're on the playground and you hit Joe and you're my seven-year-old. Mm. And I can lecture you about not hitting people, et cetera, et cetera, and, and you'll take some of that in. But it's a different kind of response when I say, what did it feel like inside when you hit him? When you think about it now, do you feel good about yourself? Do you feel bad about yourself? Because this is the part they have to be out of integrity. So, Kurt, you have to have the feeling that when I just lash out, maybe it feels good in the moment, but I, I have this emotional hangover that stays with me afterwards. And that's what we want kids, want kids to start to pay attention to. And I would say probably the skinheads or some, any, organ, any group out there that's giving consistent harm to someone else, they're not paying attention to that part. They're not quieting themselves enough to listen. Well, you've got a dogma when you're a skinhead. You've got an yeah. answer for everything. You're a gang member. Everything's clear. You know exactly what the script is before you. What happens when, when you're interested in integrity as a parent or as a kid or anybody, it's you're curious about your life. You know, how did I get here? What, what, and, and to make that yeah. process conscious is, I think, everything in parenting. It's everything. Because as parents, we, we tend to think, well, I got to think of the long haul. I got to think, well, what's going to happen today that's going to matter 30 years from now? Good. That's a good issue. Kids, they have the opposite time temporal framework. You know, what's going to matter now? What's important now for me to do? And this is especially acutely true and, and acutely more risky during adolescence. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the wonderful thing about the emphasis upon integrity and about asking questions, about not having the answers but having the right questions is that these become the same. Living in the moment and living in the long term are the same thing. Hmm. In fact, if they're not, um, you're not asking the right questions yet. And the, the beautiful thing is kids aren't necessarily compliant because they have yes. a lot of ah, integrity. This is great. Maybe the opposite. And as parents, you'll, you'll know this because your kids will be asking you questions. And they've got a curiosity about themselves and about you that some may make you a little uncomfortable. Um, and that's a, real, that's a hallmark of integrity. Because think of anyone that you look up to who has integrity. At some point, it was tested. And they had to stand up probably alone for something that's important to them. And that's the opposite of being compliant. So I don't want to confuse this, that it's about kids just having good manners and being compliant right. and going along with the adults. 
because that's something else. Right. In fact, and one of the well, here's some great news about all the conflict you're going to have in your families. Mm -hmm. That is, here's here's the great news about conflict. It shows the kids care. It mm -hmm. gives you a chance to struggle. They stand up against you. That is their crucible. That is their way to come to terms with their own integrity. Mm -hmm. So when you're having a fight with your teenager <coughs> or your seven-year-old or your nine-year-old, mm -hmm. this is just the beginning of creating a, a great citizen mm -hmm. <laughs> and a great parent and a great spouse. I think you actually wrote early on in the book about how um, th this focus on integrity allows more room for love within the family, and it seems yeah. like that gets to the point you're talking about, less anxiety within the family. And yeah. I mean, how does all that work? Well, yeah. well one thing I would say is a lot less rules. You know, you don't have a, a rule for everything as much as simplistically it gets down to pay attention to that part of you that knows what's right to do. But also it makes us all much more human mm -hmm. because what parent can say, I've never lost it with my kid. I've always said exactly what I, I, when I think about it later on, I feel really good about everything I've said. None of us. We all mess up. Mm -hmm. And it's about recognizing that real... Um, influence with our kids is they require us to be more human so after Joe does something wrong and I, I scold him for it and I get carried away and mm -hmm. who doesn't get carried away it means I've got to go back to him and say Joe I'm sorry I shouldn't have yelled I, it's not okay for me to yell and we need to talk about what you did so that I'm not giving up my power but I'm showing them how because this is important I'm showing them how to get back into integrity, which is I've lost it by yelling at them. It kept me up all night. I yelled too much. Now I can come back and say, I'm real, I, I apologize for that. I shouldn't have done that. Now let's talk about the other issue. I'm modeling for him how to get back into integrity. And when kids know they can get back into it, it's much easier to pay attention to it on the front end. And you've been picking on me a lot today. I know. Sorry, sorry which, Joe, which, I mean, I'm bullying is, 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 is a key, is a wonderful issue here at some right. point. Yeah. I, w I was hoping, though, that even though it would probably be good for television, that there won't be any scolding or, or any of that going on. <laughs> well, if you don't get to it in a hurry, we might have to get there, young man. <laughs> uh, getting into chapter one, I mean, one of the things that your book, it, w it was very helpful for me because, as I talked about, I've got, you know, a child who's 11, another one who's 9, another one who's 6, and, a, and another one who's almost 2. Um, and you take, basically, the, the book goes through these d different periods of, of life. And chapter 1 talks about how uh, the changes that a 5-year-old might experience, um, it, it, it will result in a whole slew of negative behaviors. How, how does that work, and how is that related to integrity? Well, all this story, the, the, the book is organized in, in a series of, of narratives followed by notes home mm -hmm. and conversations about w what happens. And, and, and every experience is very... And, and I would add, each mm -hmm. chapter looks at an age, and right. we also try to sketch developmentally what's going on for the kids in that age so you can understand their world a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, we could have chosen, you know, 12 or 40 other kinds of scenarios, but mm -hmm. in, in, in each chapter, it's, for instance, it's about um, you know, a discussion about whether Santa Claus exists. Well, that's a pretty burning issue for a five-year-old. Right. Uh, we talk about um, an issue, uh, a shoplifting incident. Mm -hmm. We talk about, um, help me here, Michael. A pet. A pet, a mm -hmm. uh, when a pet right. dies. Um, and then the crisis involving uh, the, the mother who gets uh, terribly ill right. in the family right. um, rallies around her. Yeah, so someone well. cruising um, porn sites on, uh, on a computer. Mm -hmm. um, someone uh, going ballistic on a soccer field. Someone, in other words, the kinds of things to keep parents yeah, exactly. awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and here's the point. What, mm -hmm. we, what we find is all these mundane, I mean, they're not mundane in the moment because it looks like the world is coming apart. Mm -hmm. But in these mundane kinds of moments, these profound truths come out when we're open to the experience. When I say, well, this is, once again, being curious, what's happening here? That, and what's so important about Santa Claus? Well, you know, to a five-year-old, it's pretty important. Now, if it's a 14-year-old asking about Santa Claus, you have many other problems. But mm -hmm. if it's your five-year-old wondering about Santa Claus, mm -hmm. well, then you have a great opportunity to talk about fantasy, about imagination, about love, about, uh, about family. Right. In, in the story you mentioned, Kurt, is an interesting one because it's about a five-year-old who picked up after school, um, goes into a store with his mom and steals a candy bar. And she finds out later, she sees the wrapper, and she feels guilty. She's a single parent. When single parents are susceptible to this, they feel like, is it, is it because I'm a single parent? Why is my son stealing? And we go through it, and one of the things we see about kids is, younger kids especially, transitions are difficult for them. The mm -hmm. transition from school to home, it's usually when they're hungry, you know, just a word of advice to parents picking your five-year-olds up have something for them to eat in the car. It changes their mood, it makes them more stable. Mm -hmm. This mom took the child to a store, he hadn't eaten, he was hungry. When we get tired and transitions, this is when kids get impulsive. And he just grabbed the candy bar. The good news is, 
that on one level he knew that it was wrong because at home he tried to sneak it. He didn't let his mom see it. And she saw the rapper and then they had this big confrontation. Talks about how to handle the confrontation and how to, in dealing with this, bring integrity to the front burner. How to make that the real issue. Not that he disobeyed the law or he got in trouble with mom, but how did he disappoint himself and what could he do to rectify that situation. And the good news is kids are tuned into this as a question. They are every, they are every bit as curious about this development inside of themselves as we are mm -hmm. about our own lives. Right. And so any kind of experience can be a formative experience. And, and the wonderful, crazy thing about being a parent is you get lots of opportunities for formative experiences. You sort of can't avoid them. You wake up, there's a formative experience. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you stay away, though, from, from the tremendous guilt? Because I, I think part of the thing that was going on with Trisha and Sam, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. was after Sam stole the candy bar, it was like now Trisha coming in on herself and saying, okay, what was it that I did that might have caused Sam to react in this way, to steal a candy bar and eat it? I'm Italian. I was born <laughs> guilty. That's it. <laughs> no. you know, I can't get away from it. It's, it's a great question to ask, but not to get consumed by. Mm -hmm. It's really about our kids. Right. And yeah. He took that candy bar, and maybe mom could have done some things differently, but we said right at the outset, you learn integrity by being out of it. Mm -hmm. He had to learn it by being out of it. He had to make a mistake. We learn some of our best things by ma making some mistakes. Mm -hmm. And she's got to be able to step back and say, okay, these are all my issues. I need to let go of them because that's not going to help my son. My right. son now needs me to be very clear. He did something wrong. And yes, he's going to feel a little guilt about it, but this is naturally healthy, good, I mean, this is the kind of guilt we want our kids to have. Not the other kind of guilt that we impose on them, but the one that comes from doing something wrong. Yeah, and having, and being willing to let your kids feel bad, stay mm -hmm. in the moment, that, that takes a tremendous amount of uh, courage on mm -hmm. our parts. Just let them sit. I mean, we, we, we're used to this in schools. I mean, uh, Michael and I have worked a lot in schools, and we know we don't want the kids to silt, sit with the the the, un, the, dis, the discomfort. We want them to, because why? Because that's when the work is starting to happen. Mm -hmm. That's when they're beginning to think, "Well, gee, you know, I do feel uneasy." And the good news here is, and despite all the news that you, you hear uh, in the media. I'm not blaming the media, but you, the, the news you hear is that kids are available to mm -hmm. this. They are receptive to this. There is one thing they're concerned about, and that is their identity. Mm. That, what's, what's, it being a te what's a teenager being all, all about? It's about defining herself and himself. It's integrity. Actually made a connection for me because we were talking earlier about how it's it's hard sometimes for a lot of us to get out of being a teenager, and I think we both <laughs> <Yeah>. agree. <laughs> well, what's your absolute age? Uh, I'm not going to go on this. One. <laughs> but, but we mentioned, uh, or you talked about the Santa Claus situation. Yeah. I think that actually arose in the context of a six-year-old, mm -hmm. and you both talked about how um, the six-year-old sort of has this sense that you know Santa is no longer real because how is it possible for him to get to all of the houses around the right. world, and yet at the same time can still say, "But Santa has brought me everything I wanted." I mean. It, it seemed like there's a little bit of a contradiction there right. because you're fostering the sense that you know Santa's a fantasy, but at the same time, he's not. There's a reality here that we have to get, get in touch with. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. that's kid, why there are poems. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and the, thing, the thing about kids is that we need to understand this is a developmental issue is that adults can be in reality or in fantasy, kids can be in both at the same time. And they have no problem with being able to say to you, Santa Claus can't exist because how could he get around the world? How could he do this? How could he do that? And at the same time, here's my list for Santa Claus. Because they can be in both worlds. I mean, I think it was, um, what was the television show that we talked about in the book? Sesame Street. Sesame yeah. Street. Right. It was yeah. a great example because when they did Sesame Street at first, they were hugely concerned that they had these made-up characters and scenes with real kids, mm. and that it was really going to lead kids to confusing reality. So they tried to keep it separate, the pretend characters and the real characters, one or the other at, at a time with the kids, and, this, and the show was boring. Mm -hmm. It wasn't working. Mm -hmm. They put the, them together at the last minute, and all of a sudden, it was, the kids couldn't stay away from it. It was very engaging, and there was no long-term effects to this. And it shows us the kids know the difference between reality and fantasy, and they can be in both at the same time. And with Santa Claus, the idea is you don't want to yank reality into the picture too soon to take that fantasy away, that great longing and, and curiosity kind of stuff. You don't want to yank that away, but you don't want to set them up so that they get, they face teasing by the friends and that kind of thing. So there's a nice line you can walk about, and that's what we talked about in that, in that chapter. Yeah, there's probably Thank you. I, we'll continue this discussion after a minute. We got the first break. Thanks very much for being with us. Books of our time. The book today is Right from Wrong. Thanks.
Integrity first. Service before self. Excellence in all we do. These are not just words. These are our core values. Values by which each and every member of the Air Force Reserve lives. So whether we are deploying humanitarian aid or providing natural disaster relief or defending freedom wherever it's threatened, the men and women of the Air Force Reserve are there, protecting our values and serving our country. Air Force Reserve, above and beyond. There is strength in our numbers. Our call is to action, to practice what we preach. Be there to care. Our passion is compassion. We're only human, but together we're humane. Our letters stand for taking a stand, for taking the lead, for filling the need. The American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Be part of our heart. Exercise your emotions. Attend a live orchestra concert. Go to findaconcert.com. on Books of Our Time. We're here discussing the book Right From Wrong with Mike Riera and Joe DePrisco. And uh, the last segment, we were talking at the end about um, Santa Claus. And uh, it, in our break, uh, <laughs> Joe was kind <laughs> enough to share a little anecdote with me. So. Well, I mean, how, how crucial uh, Santa Claus can be to a child or a family. This, I don't think this is an apocryphal story. So the six-year-old says to his parents, uh, you know, I know there's no Santa Claus. And they say, really? How long have you known that? Oh, a long time. Well, why didn't you tell us? I didn't want to disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's the true point here and why I think it's not apocryphal? Uh -huh. Is that I think, I think, I want you to weigh in on this. I think families put together, you know, the, uh, a mythology that is very important mm. and that we can sustain this and it goes to large issues of playing and imagination and that this kind of fiction making and this mythology making is, real, is, is liberating. I mean, it's not lying. I mean, this is why people who get hung up about integrity as being some, some absolute, absolute yeah. standard of honesty, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to go to dinner parties with these people because it's not a very interesting <laughs> point of way to look at the yeah. world. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think you also wrote about um, how it, it's sometimes uh, best in questions about Santa to talk about how you know it, it's it's better to, to help form your character by allowing you to keep playing in the sandbox. And I think uh, the quote was something about how, how if, if children don't keep scratching away at poems and playing in sandboxes and doing those kinds of things, they might wind up being being uh, adults later on who maybe are are cultish or uh, attached to fads or whatever it is. I mean, how, how does that wind up? In, in that was an idea of Bruno Bettelheim, a famous uh. psychologist who said he really believed that if kids don't have enough time in the imagination as adults, they become very susceptible to cults. And it's sort of the imagination, you know, maligned in some ways and comes out in a different direction. And our experience is that kids need to have that free play. They need to have their imaginations exercised. That's why around Santa, it's a wonderful moment for a child. It's a, it's a crisis. Is Santa Claus exist or right. not? And that's mm -hmm. a real crisis. And we don't want to give them an easy answer. We want them to just stretch their imagination. And most kids will say, you know, I can see maybe where it might not exist, but this is too big of a big deal to give up on completely. I'm still going to cover my bases and write the list, or I'm still going to believe. And this is where parents can say, you know, you, your son might say to you, do you believe in Santa Claus, Dad? And you say, you know, I believe in the magic of Christmas. That might be your answer. Mm -hmm. it, it may be a little elusive, but it's, again, leading more to that mystery, that imagination, which I think is so healthy for kids. Right. Yeah, and in, 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 in the broadest sense for us, I think, for kids, it's that 
to quote uh, William Butler Yeats, the great poet, in dreams begin responsibilities. In dreams mm -hmm. begin responsibilities because in those dreams, things we can imagine, we get to be able to, to take, we, we get to form our social uh, lives. We get to form our political lives, our political identities. Mm our intellectual identities, they come from dreams. Right. Yeah. I think we talked also at lunch about, uh, somebody brought up the fact that it, it's different being a kid these days, uh, you know, largely because just the way society has changed, and now if you send your kid out to the playground at five o'clock in the afternoon, you might worry whether or not he'll right. ever come back. Uh, but by the same token, the, the notion was that, you know, playground type play is is almost a thing of the past. You know, mm -hmm. When I went out as a, as a child, it was like my mom said, okay, just go out and play, and I'd be gone until nine o'clock at night, whatever curfew yeah. was. And, yeah. Yeah. and you sure. learn so many important skills there that have to do with integrity about being whole. You know, you got to the playground, you negotiated with your friends, what are you gonna do? If what you wanted to do was at odds with what they wanted to do, mm -hmm. you had to decide, is it more important to be with my friends or to do what I wanna do? Then you make a decision accordingly. Mm -hmm. It was about influence, how to take those three kids and convince them that what you want to do was better than what they had the ideas to do. All this kind of, uh, and it's all dependent on me, and I'm learning different ways to do this with the kids when we're bored. You come up with games. I mean, how many kids would you see throwing a ball against a brick wall now and playing baseball somehow, come up with their own game that they would create? Sure. Kids aren't doing that as much now because mm -hmm. they don't have that. Parents, for the benefit of their kids, we're putting them in pre-made activities get to the practice on time, bring your violin, et cetera. You get them there and it happens. There's nothing about this starting anymore, which I, we think integrity is really born in that. Yeah, and kids are obviously oversubscribed. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. And, right. and it's very difficult to, for families and for kids to, to sustain a sense of balance and, and commonsensical uh, wisdom about getting along in life. And in, our, in Northern California, where we're from, I mean, the soccer leagues run the world. Mm. They run the, the lives of parents right. uh, almost every weekend. Now, is this healthy? Of course not. And why it's an issue of integrity is, 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 is very clear. It's because this is, because when kids aren't programmed, when they aren't on teams all the time, when they get to be by themselves, they get to find out who they are. I mean, one thing, you, you can learn a lot of great things on, on, about being on a team, and let's get into those later at some point. Mm -hmm. But one thing you don't necessarily learn is how to be alone mm -hmm. and how, how to dream. And, and if we're gonna if we're gonna have a culture in which uh, we're gonna promote that kind of stuff, then we also need to have a culture in which people it's okay not to not to be programmed every weekend. Well, I guess there, at least there's the hope for the rest of us that not every idea that originates in Southern California or in California <laughs> will spread throughout the rest of the yeah. country. <laughs> not everyone. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but back back to it, like a, an issue that might arise some 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 conflict in the discussion, and that is uh, I talked earlier about how. Um, there, there was a news item that I saw on, on TV one time, and, and basically what it said is that, that parents are now getting their toddlers into programs where they'll learn how to take tests. Because, you know, like in this state and, and various others around the country, it's now all about standardized testing. But it, it worried me. I mean, th that's concerning when you see like a three-year-old going into a school environment where they're set down and said, okay, now here are your ABCs or here's your math skills, and, and by the end of this day, you have to learn this. I mean, why can that be so harmful? You want to tell me? It's too depressing for me to answer. <laughs> I mean, it's so harmful because our kids aren't little automatons. Mm -hmm. They school is de it was developed to, to meet the developmental needs of kids when they're ready. When you start pushing them too early, their brains don't work this way. Mm -hmm. It cuts off their imagination. But here's the thing: it cuts off most curiosity. Mm -hmm. Curiosity is what makes people learners. So it's what keeps you doing the job you do, whether it's hosting here or at the law school teaching. It's that curiosity and it's always churning up more and more possibilities. When kids are tested all the time and learn how to take tests, they're just learn they're being taught how to play a game. And I'll tell you, one of the things we'll see with these kids, and I know no parent wants to hear this, but if our kids are continually taught how to take tests, how to do well in the system, it's gonna lead them to a lot of cheating because it's all about end results. It's not about how you get there. And you're gonna see kids beginning to cheat even more than they do now because it's all about end results. And that is the complete antithesis of integrity, which is following your curiosity, following your heart, trusting yourself, making some mistakes along the way, but learning the lessons. And this whole thing of testing is, uh, the other piece I have to ask is, why are we in such a hurry to have our kids grow up? Why does it matter if they learn to read at four year old, at six years old, at seven years old? Why does it matter? All the research shows that there's not a big difference. They
It was someone who was on a soccer team, and um, what happened was that, that she was not a good a, as player, a player as she could have been because she actually was moved ahead too quickly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and rather being on the JVs or whatever the team, the Pee Wees, I think it was, mm -hmm. she yeah. was moved up because they thought she was good enough to be there. And yet when she got there, she realized she didn't have the skills, and now all of a sudden she's in a conflict with the coach, with other players, she, because she's not playing as well. I mean, how, how do you deal with something like that where, you know, parents really try and push their kids, you know, too far ahead before they're time. Well, she's in conflict with everybody in this yeah. narrative, and it's a completely mundane situation. Every, this happens all the time, where kids can continually, in an effort to please adults, coaches, parents, whatever, mm -hmm. they get to find out that finally they can only please themselves. And in her case, she wasn't getting, she wasn't enjoying. She wasn't, she wasn't, having, any she wasn't having any fun. Mm -hmm. So as a result, what happens? She does crazy things. Right. Yeah. yeah tackle someone, yeah, I think, right, and that right. was sort of an illegal move. But right. And that, yeah. that's, I think, one takeaway that I encourage parents to think about. When your kid does something that seems out of character with them, mm -hmm. it probably is out of character. And there's some other reason that they did this. And part of our job as parents is to step back and say, okay, she tackled someone in the game, or they cheated on a test, or he teased somebody. That's not like him. What else could be going on? What are the other things that are going on? Am I pushing him too fast? Are his peers influencing him too much? Does he have too many activities going on? And usually there's an answer there, right on the outskirts. But our kids don't know how to say this to us, so they just react, and they react in uncharacteristic ways, and they count on us to do the translation. Hmm. Right. And that's just the beginning of the, of the conversation. It's not that kind of blow up is, is an opportunity for all of us to talk, talk through it. Mm -hmm. As the parent does, and right. and once again, focusing on what what's what are you saying about yourself when you do this? And, and here's the thing about kids that I love. I'm, I'm the head of a school back in in Oakland, and we recently had a kindergartner who was the right age for kindergarten, but she was way ahead of her peers intellectually in reading and math, and socially she was too. So we worked with her for a while and then moved her ahead. Now that seems like the opposite of what I've been saying, mm -hmm. but she was ready to move ahead, and she's been thriving. She's just been having a great time in first grade. She's still connected to the kindergartner. She's doing well intellectually, socially, emotionally. She was ready for it. So we can't just come up with a simple rule. Don't put kids ahead. Hold, keep them back at their age level because maybe they need to move ahead to be challenged and to stay engaged. And this is, to me, the fascinating part about kids and why, as adults working with kids, we have to have our own integrity. It's not about a rule. It's about getting to know this child and then making an informed decision. Yeah, this is not, I don't think, in conflict with achievement, excellence like that. It, it, in fact, yeah. real achievement is predicated upon the desires that kids bring to the experience. But yeah, we can, we can certainly, we continually, uh, as parents, I think, do, and teachers, uh, we find ways to encourage kids to look into themselves, to challenge themselves. It's not about, this is gonna sound like a California, we are not those kind of Californians. We don't believe in self-esteem. <laughs> uh, we believe in self-esteem that comes from real achievement. Mm -hmm. And that's where kids, that's where, and kids know this, because kids see through false praise, and they see through uh, the effort to pump them up with uh, false uh, self-esteem. Hmm. One of the things we, we also talked about at lunch was that this, this system that seems to be in place you know, throughout America, and that is that always award the kids with something. I mean, right. one, yeah. one, one, one day, my, uh, the, the seven-year-old came home from school, and he had an award. And I said, Ben, that's great. What, what's the award for? And he said, well, you know, we, our, our team came in last place. And I said, OK, well, why did you get the award? And he said, well, <laughs> all the teams got awards. <laughs> I mean, why can that be so damaging? And, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> a bad, where do you begin? Yeah. I mean, what, what we're doing is, and, and this has come in the name of self-esteem, mm -hmm. that we feel like we want our kids to have self-esteem to feel good about themselves. So it turns out to we reward kids for things they don't deserve rewards for. Mm -hmm. We praise them for things they don't deserve praise for. So that if you bring home a paper, I might say great paper, if it was a great paper. If it was an okay paper, my, many parents will say really good work in the idea that maybe I can motivate him to do better the next time. And if someone comes home with a lousy paper, they might still say, oh, that was a good paper because I don't want to damage him. I don't want him to have low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. When in fact, kids know. They know whether they do a good job or not. Mm -hmm. And our job isn't as much to praise them, but to look at the effort. What are they putting into it? What are they getting from it? You know, you got this paper you bring home and it's an A. I might say, Kurt, what do you think of this? Well, I, I think it's really good. Or you might say, eh, it's an A. She gave everyone an A. It doesn't make a big deal. Mm -hmm. But I find out your experience. And that's what kids need. Because we, as we looked at the relationship of self-esteem and integrity, someone mm -hmm. with high self-esteem may not have integrity. 
Hmm. Someone with integrity has high self-esteem because it comes from real, genuine, authentic achievement, and that's what really matters to kids. In, in, in fact, you can have very low self-esteem and be doing wonderful work because uh, you understand it's complicated. The world is complicated. I'm not, I'm not writing the poems I want. I'm not doing the things I need to do. Mm -hmm. And you can actually be too hard on yourself, which goes to the other issue about self-evaluation. In, in all the exercises that teachers do with, with mm -hmm. students, you know, to, to grade their own work, uh, mm -hmm. or uh, invariably, students are harder on themselves than 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 we would ever be. Mm -hmm. What does that teach us about integrity? In, in all my years in education, when I would have kids grade themselves, yeah. only one student in 20 years gave himself a grade higher than I was going to give him. Mm -hmm. Everyone right. else gave themselves the same grade or a lower grade. And I think on balance, I mean, it could be it could have a dark side here, but on balance, I think what it says is kids see themselves clearly. They know what they're looking for is important and they're ready to tell the truth. Now I know this flies in the face of the com common wisdom that kids are, are out to, in this reality TV kind of world, mm -hmm. in this uh, celebrity culture soaked world that you know kids are not up for that. But you mm -hmm. know, our experience working with kids is just not true. By the same token, another thing we talked about at lunch was, well, if you have just reality TV shows, and that's the basis for kids' reality, assuming parents will actually let them watch those kind of things. I mean, I think right. the person who brought this up was said, well, it's, well, you know, it's lying, it's cheating, it's stealing. These are all the ways that you get ahead. I mean, and, and don't we teach them that it's, it's all about that kind of process rather than using the, the right kind of, uh, of ways to get ahead? This, this is one of those interesting areas where there's not one right rule. I mean, I think part of our job as parents is to help our kids translate, to understand this is a game they're playing, this is a competition. Just like if you were on the soccer field playing against the other team, they're using strategies to win this game. That's what it's about. This mm -hmm. isn't the way you live life. And sometimes you can play with kids, you know, what if daddy and mommy were this way? You know, what would life be like in the household? You know, trying to, and all of a sudden kids will start laughing. They'll come up with all these examples. We want to point out some of the absurdity of it. And it's also why, quite frankly, as, as parents, we need to get in the habit of turning the TV off, turning the computer off, doing some old-fashioned things like going for a walk with one another, mm -hmm. cooking a meal together, going on vacation together. Just being with one another is really important and is, is also what helps us create the antidote to this kind of stuff. Back to that awards culture for a second, because another thing we, we talked about was, well, great inflation and mm. how our school is, is sort of fighting against that. Yeah. A couple of years ago, the trustees at Harvard College realized, well, you know, if we keep giving out as many A's and B's as we are, there won't really be any recognition of what is good work because everybody's going to graduate cum laude. Mm -hmm. But I think that you said your school is taking a different, a different approach on that to try and point out. Yeah, well, and, and schools have to take a conscious approach to it. They have to say mm -hmm. that our grades are out of whack. And not everybody here is an A student. Mm -hmm. So how do we get the faculty to, to understand that? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you have a discussion about developmental realities. And you have, and you, and you, and you actually force people to to understand that, not force them, invite them to understand that when kids are are putting their work before you, this is your opportunity to teach. A grade is is a teaching tool. That there are things to be learned from this from this experience, and where you're lacking here is is in these areas, and this is where the grade can be reflected. So it becomes a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's telling the kids ahead of time, it's telling the parents, and also, you know, what we did very practically is we called the admissions directors of the schools around us and said, you're going to see our grades and our kids go down a little bit. It doesn't mean they know less. In fact, they probably know more. Mm -hmm. But we really want to get rid of this grade inflation. And the admissions resp director's response was, yay, great, <laughs> someone's finally doing this. We don't have to go through the fine-tooth comb to look for the difference between the A plus and the A. Mm -hmm. If an A means an A, it really means an A. That means there's going to be some Bs and Cs. And there, there shouldn't be shame associated with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now we're afraid that our kids will fall apart if they right. get a B. Right. They're not going to fall apart. You yeah. got Bs, you got Bs, I got Bs. Well, we seem to be okay. <laughs> okay. I got a few other grades too, you know. <laughs> what about the awards too? I thought that was real interesting. I guess your school gives out just one award. One award. Yeah. yeah. yeah we give out one award, and it's a very interesting award because it's for it's for a, a sad circumstance, a child who died a number of years ago, and the re award is named for him. And, and what's really great about it is, he was a quirky guy. Hmm. He was curious. He was a little bit of a rebel. Um, he wasn't afraid to ask the hard question. He got in a little bit of trouble. So it, the award goes to someone who, you know, epitomizes who he was. Mm -hmm. Now that's not necessarily, as a parent, you're not saying you want your child necessarily to win this award, because, but it's something mm -hmm. that means a lot in the community. And the idea is we're Sorry, we'll have to go to a break, um, but we'll come sure. back right after this uh, short break. And we're here doing the books of our time show, Right from Wrong, with Mike Riera and Joe DePrisco. Thanks very much.
I'm still at the train station. I just almost got killed. Yeah, about 10 minutes ago. I'm still shaking. Well, I got off the 940 and Jill called. Yeah, it was raining, and so I put the newspaper over my head. I forgot my umbrella, and I didn't want to go walk over the overpass. And then I heard the whistle and the light. I was walking right into a train. This guy, he, he pulled me back. Look, listen, and live, or someone you love will get hurt. I just almost died. How far would you go to help someone? Would you go to the end of your driveway? Would you cross a street? Would you cross an ocean? To a place 6,000 miles from home? How long would you go? Would you go for a week, a month, a year? Would you go for two years? Would you go if you could use your knowledge to teach someone and in the process, maybe learn something yourself? Life is calling. How far will you go? back with Books of Our Time with uh, Mike Riera and Joe DePrisco. The book is Right From Wrong, Instilling a Sense of Integrity in Your Child. Um, when we last spoke, we were talking about um, uh, divorce and parents and how kids can deal with that situation, which is often very difficult both for parents mm -hmm. and for kids. Um, how, how do you help the, the typical seven-year-old or how would you advise parents to help them deal with that kind of setting? Well, I think what you do is, once again, focusing on, on the issue of integrity, is to understand that your child is going through exactly, in a sense, what you're going through, only without the experience to, to give him or her the kind of uh, assumptions that, well, you know, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The sun may not come up tomorrow. After divorce, it may, it may not happen mm -hmm. in his imagination. So what we do is we're continue. It, it, it takes a lot of redundancy, I think, in, in families. There's a continual coming back to, you know, the first principles. Okay, because kids, a seven-year-old has to think the divorce is about himself or herself. Mm -hmm. That that's a breakthrough to understanding at some point. And then when, after that happens, which will take years and years, I mean, it's like a death. Mm -hmm. I mean, a divorce is like a death. It's going to take at least a year, and a younger probably longer. Mm -hmm. uh, but before, before you can really get a sense of what really has happened, how, I can, how this changes my life, you know what's radically upended your life, and yet you know that if your parents are there, if they're articulating continually, not, not necessarily verbally, mm -hmm. but articulating emotionally, spiritually, psychologically that, you know, we're with you in this, we know this is not easy for you to go through, I think you've got a chance. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's not going to be easy. It, it's important to um, make sure that you keep the kids first, that your arguments happen. I mean, there's n nothing yeah. new here, mm -hmm. but you don't want to argue in front of the kids. You want to see the kids see you working together for them. Mm -hmm. um, it means don't promise anything you can't follow up on. You know, don't say everything will be fine, we'll never leave this house, because mm. that may change. You have to show them that you're always going to be there. Your actions speak louder than your words, mm. by far and away, what you do. You know, this is why divorced parents, I think, are tested 10 times more than parents that are together, because if you say you're going to pick them up at 3 o'clock, you've got to be there at 3 o'clock. Because when you show at 3.15, you're 15 minutes late, but those 15 minutes, they felt abandoned. Mm. They felt like you weren't going to come there. Even though, if for another child with two parents still together, 
parents are 15 minutes late, they're annoyed at them. But the divorced child, often in the beginning, it's a sense of abandonment. So you have to go out of your way to make sure your kids have that sense of security. And the place it starts is with your word and your commitments to them, that you really stick with them. Yeah, everything is, is, is much more highly charged and symbolic. But it, I think the bottom line is here, parenting is still parenting. It's parenting, you know, single, if you're a single parent, it's parenting if it's, it's the nuclear family. It's still the same principles apply. Hmm. And I, a cut one, I, I just work for an organization called Kids Turn, and they actually have a wonderful on-site uh, online um, website. It's called KidsTurn.org. Hmm. And one of the things they pointed out was it's very important to teach the kids the language of divorce. You know what an attorney is, what a judge is, what happens at these kinds of proceedings, so that when those words are used around them, they can feel included. They have a sense. They have a sense of what's going on. And and I think it's also knowing that. You're going to read a, a, a parent going through a divorce is going to read a lot of books about going through divorce. They should. They should find out what other families have gone through. Find out what's normal, what's not normal. But also, ultimately, it comes down to your son or daughter. Hmm. You know them best, and our integrity requires that we follow their lead. Hmm. They may want to know some details. There may be other details they don't want to know. They may want to see a therapist. They may not want to see a therapist. They may want to talk about it. They may not want to talk about it. But we need to keep knocking on the door and asking because. Because if I say my 12-year-old didn't want to talk about it, that was when he was 12. When he's 13, maybe he's going to want to talk about it. Yeah, and, and the crucial thing is not to get lost in our own guilt hmm. about what, what's happened, and because yeah. we're not going to help anybody. Guilt or, or level of frustration, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that, that I've, I've had a lot of trouble with, and my, my wife is, is constantly reminding me, you know, you have to remember that she's the, the kid and you're the adult. And right. I, you know, I think those are great words of wisdom for me, but I mean, one thing that, that the 11-year-old says a lot of times, and, and this hap actually happened on Thanksgiving Day when we're all sitting around the table, and she looked up and she said, you know, I wish I was back in East Derry Memorial High School, and the Memorial Elementary School, because that, those were the best five years of my life. Right. And it's, I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. one of those things that just stabs at the heart, and you think, well, you know, what, what have we done wrong that makes her think that, you know, makes her want to go back to a place that we left, you know, after the divorce. Well, t take a turn here. I think mm -hmm. what happens here is I think parents and kids are creating new families, these, these mm -hmm. blended families. And these are, these are new realities. And, they're, and yeah, there are new rituals. There are new issues. But they're real. And they're valuable. And kids, over time, can, can make their home with that. You're not, you're never, I've never met a divorced parent who's felt great about it in the short term. Just mm -hmm. never have. Now, maybe they exist. Uh, but, for, but kids won't believe that they exist right. because kids, for them, it's the crisis of their lives. It's interesting, this story about an 11-year-old, because this is a great case of where it's not about us, it's about the right. kids. Mm -hmm. He's 11. Right. My hunch is he's probably getting a little bit more trouble, he's probably a little more curious, probably standing up for himself to you a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a test. An 11-year-old can't say, Dad, um, I'm becoming 11, and as I do, I'm going to test the limits a little bit more, and I just want to make sure you're going to be there for me. Mm -hmm. that, but that's what he's saying. He's right. testing you. You know, are you still going to be there? Are you still going to love him? Is the love unconditional or is it conditional? So you might, you, your response might be, ah, oh, you know, I'm, actually I'm glad we're here. I like what's going on here. But you, you're, what you're going to say to him, not in words, but in the tone of your voice and the way you move your body is, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. You're part of this family. This is a family that's new family and we're going to be here. There's a wonderful study that just came out uh, uh, this week, actually. It was in the uh, journal, uh, American Psychology Journal. Longitudinal study, thousands of families, about seventh graders and high school kids. And it's at the seventh grade, it's in, when kids are in the seventh grade, that's when, that's the great, when you're in connection with your kids, when you have the great relationship going with the kids, that's the greatest predictor of success and happiness and family mm. when kids are in the 11th grade. Now, why is that? Well, it's because you forge these, these bonds of identity, but at the same time, you're involved. You can't be the aloof parent, and you can't be, in other words, everything goes, and you can't be somebody for whom uh, you know, rules are, are uppermost. That is, you need you need a balance, and it, and it, and you can do it. You can articulate the balancing point. Hmm. I think you mentioned in, in the book there was a quote, something along the lines of modeling resilience in the face of loss, yeah. or, or something along those lines. And and I think within that same chapter, you talked about how um, a new puppy, 
might be good for a blended family. And then there was some discussion about how um, the old puppy, when the old puppy died, uh, the, the vet said, you know, all of the kids should be out of this room. And that brought to mind my own experience with it, with the dog that I had. Even though I've owned like six dogs in my life, uh, mm -hmm. the one that I remember, I still recall his face sometimes at night when I wake up. It, Boomer was the dog that the vet said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna inject Boomer with a lethal injection. Do you wanna stay in the room or not? Giving me the option, I think that was a problem because I stayed. And that's why Boomer's face stays with me. I mean, is that the kind of thing, modeling resilience, would, you would obviously want to keep the kids out of the room, but how can you help them overcome the loss of a, a favored family pet, pet or something well, like you that? Know, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know that you necessarily, every kid is different. Mm -hmm. I know some kids that, that need to be there when that happens. They mm -hmm. need to have the finality of it. Mm -hmm. I think you can say, you know, would you like to be here when we do this? And the child might say, yes. I might ask more questions and say, you know, this is what it's going to be like. It's not going to be pretty. Mommy and Daddy are going to be crying, too. We, may, we might be crying. Is that OK? And many kids will decide then not to be there. Others will still decide to be there, but they know what the picture is going to look like. And then part of resiliency is we model for them. We don't, we don't have to even model this. We allow to, ourselves to be transparent in our emotions, that we go to the park, we see the tennis ball, and all of a sudden you know, we get a little sad. And our child says, why are you sad? Or we say. I'm sad looking at this tennis ball because we used to play this with Boomer all the time and I love throwing the tennis ball. And, mm -hmm. and they see that we can be sad, we can have these feelings, and we can be moving on. And when, then when the time's right, you know, they may say, let's get a new puppy. Mm -hmm. And we might say, love to get a new puppy, but I think I need at least a few more months to get over Boomer and then we'll get a new puppy. But let's start doing some research if we want. That we model we're going to move forward, but we're not going to run away from these emotions. That's, I think, the message we don't want our kids to have. because. Anyone who has integrity, who really has a robust sense of it, has a full emotional life. And they're not afraid to feel really bad, to feel depressed, to feel angry, because they know they're not going to get stuck in it. But they're going to go through it, and it's going to inform them in some way. Yeah, and when kids deal with grief, mm -hmm. the thing that, that never works with them is any kind of effort to sort of put this behind us. Mm. And that's, there's no such thing as this. I don't think it's... There's no such thing when it comes to adults, and there's certainly no such thing when it comes to kids. You can only put it inside yourself, and we need to we need to be there in our sort of a raw in our emotional true state when we, when kids are struggling with this kind of stuff. Mm. And you know, because their grandparents are going to die. They're they're mm. this poor kid at, at our school. You know, mm -hmm. He died too. I mean, these kids these kids deal with it, and they find solace and consolation if they do only when we're with them completely honestly. Now that doesn't mean that we need to give them the inside of our souls here, mm -hmm. but we need to be with them, available with them. And this mm -hmm. brings up another thing that's important is ritual. Because right. kids have feelings, they need to do something with that. They can't just have, they have to do something. So with the pet, it may be that they're part of a ritual of saying goodbye to the pet. If the pet, like uh, one of our dogs was cremated and my daughter came up with the idea, let's pour to, put him in the ground and have a plant grow out of him. And we created this little ritual, and now we go back and look at that plant, and it's taken a fond meaning. It, it might mean in a divorce family that when there's, the child goes from one house to the other, that you have a ritual, that you sit down, you have a, 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 a cup of hot chocolate and a piece of toast or something or a piece of pie, and you talk about what it was like at the other parent's house and what's been going on since they've been gone, so that the ritual helps them get there. Mm -hmm. And they really, kids really need the sense of doing something. And, I, and that's and one of the... We know all this, that there, there's a that crisis when kids go from house to house in, in a divorce family situation, mm -hmm. and they're sort of carrying their whole world on their backs. Or, mm -hmm. or they're in their backpack. Yeah. They're they got backpack. everything they right. need. They got clothes at dad's and clothes at mom, and you know, they can't go to the game because you know, they left the, the, their, their uniform at mom's or they were with dad. Right. You know, I mean, these are huge issues, but mm -hmm. it's the one reason why kids eventually will long to go to college <laughs> away from home and say, this is at least one place where I can have my everything, oh, everything in one place where I really can live. Right. That actually brings us close to another, the, the final break for today. But um, you, you mentioned college, and I think there was another scenario where the, the mom got real sick. Yeah. And I, I think that I pointed out that that, that was the, probably the place in my book where you actually brought tears to my eyes because the kid who was in college, 19, 18, or 19 years old, basically gave up, sacrificed his whole life to come home because he knew that it was help help his dad if he was there to help to care for the sick mom. I mean, how how do you make sure that, that kids understand that there is a sense of responsibility outside of themselves? And, and, and what happens in this narrative is that 
I think everybody was surprised when this 19-year-old decided to come home. Even he was even he was surprised. He didn't know he had it. He didn't know how valuable it was to him. Mm -hmm. and, and it was. I think it was important. He put his life on hold. He didn't right. end it. He just put it on hold. And it was a great. You know, there were a lot of instances in that story of people living by their integrity where he listened to that part. And in some ways, I think he asked himself, "Am I going to regret this if I don't do it?" And it was the answer was yes, and that means to me that's a sign of we're listening to our integrity. You know, when when kids get in trouble, when they make a bad decision, I always go back and say to them, was there a part of you that said do something else? Mm -hmm. And most kids will say yes. And this this guy responded right away. Somehow he quieted himself down and knew he had to do that, and he presented as a different person right. back in the family. No one recognized him because now he was responsible, he right. was caring, he made a huge difference. It was a, a great sign to the mom and dad, I mean a great example for them that they could be more vulnerable with him and let him in. And I think it's part of what helped the mom is now she didn't have to hold everything anymore. Uh, anymore. And I think this is the great, the great lesson here for parents is our kids can surprise us if we're curious about them. Mm -hmm. If we're available to them to be surprised, we can... Right, and I think that ties into everything that you've said today. And I guess the last point would be, I mean, internet cheating. You know, basically, I mean, it, it, I guess it's up to us as parents to instruct kids and basically to give them that sense within themselves, like, I know this is wrong. Um, but with all of the, the messages coming to them from different places, that's got to be real difficult. How do you advise kids to do that in 30 seconds or less? <laughs> Whew. I mean, I think if we can save right away, it's wrong. Yeah. You can't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think with the internet, it's you have to. It's a slippery slope. You have to watch it. I think as parents, we have to go in and tell our kids they can't erase on the browser where they've been, so that we can go back and check periodically, and that we do this in a way that they see us going back and seeing where they're going, so that this kind of thing isn't happening. But we want to be crystal clear. I think we want to communicate with the teachers. Mm -hmm. We want you to reinforce this message. This is what we give them at home. But the internet is a place where kids right. get a little slippery, and mm -hmm. I think they know when they're wrong still, but we just need to punctuate it. That's the end of this segment of the Books of Our Time. Thanks to Mike Riera and Joe DePrisco, and hopefully we'll have you back again soon. I hope so. Hey, great. great. Thank, Thank you me. very much. This is Alan. He has cancer. This is Sarah. They've been together 46 years. Way to go, sweetheart. I'll go get it. This is the number they called when he was diagnosed so they could get answers to their questions. Kiss that ball. So they could get through this together. This is the American Cancer Society. This is who to call for help. I love you. Every year, almost 14,000 women in our country die from ovarian cancer. It can strike a woman of any age. My wife was only 36. Unfortunately, symptoms are often subtle and hard to identify. But if detected early, ovarian cancer is usually treatable. Talk to your wife about ovarian cancer, because if you think it's just a women's issue, you're wrong. As husbands, we have all felt its pain. Chronic pain is one of America's most urgent and ignored health issues. Each year we spend millions of dollars on medical research for painful diseases and conditions, but while we wait for cures, people are still suffering. Quietly, secretly, terribly. It's time for relief. That's why Congress has declared this the decade of pain control and research. To learn more, 
visit decadeofpain.org.